it used to be the case, if I have Harry Potter and I want to give it to you, I can no longer have it because it was a physical book. Now, however, I can give it to you to very, very easily. And so there's just this incredible ease of exchange. So that's one thing. I think even before that, like, um, like when you talk about can be read and appreciated by humans, like, like then when they made the copyright law, they weren't intending like a, over a billion people, like, and at uh, like at one time, like, like imagine like if you was like going into a business and they told you, all right, so your market audience is gonna be a billion people, and you're gonna sell it to a billion people, like your first, you know day or first week. That's, that's another major. It's just the scale is so big that how do you even apply or control these laws? And here's another major issue is it used to be copyright laws are made in particular nations and enforced by particular governments. So when you go online and download, so I mean, have you all been to the various sorts of websites that you can download textbooks from? None of them are hosted in the United States. They're all hosted elsewhere. Because like and that's like the Pirate Bay, which was the torrent website which changes locate like URL every like two years as somebody gets uh, arrested. It's always hosted somewhere in like Sweden or Norway or somewhere in that area because the US government doesn't have control there. So that's another issue. As this spread gets more and more, not only is it easier to exchange, when it gets exchanged, it's much, much harder to arrest people. And there are so many people now that have copies. Like it used to be if somebody got an illegal copy of a book, you could probably count on one hand the number of people who had an illegal copy of a book. Now you'd need like, you know, everybody's hand in the city of New York to count how many people have illegal copies of a particular song or textbook. Like when, remember when HBO was getting hacked and Game of Thrones was getting posted before it showed up on television? Um, so basically, somebody got into the HBO, would post Game of Thrones like six hours before the episodes were actually getting aired, and with like hundreds of thousands to millions of downloads within that first hour. And it's like, how do you control that? That scale is insane. Um, what are some other issues? Let's talk about this appreciated or read by humans. We said there's a new type of intellectual property, a type of intellectual property that didn't exist before the computer. What is it? Software. Can software be read and appreciated by humans? This is exactly the issue. Is we have something, computer code has multiple layers. There's what the programmer writes in a language like Python or Java or something like that, which is readable by humans who speak the computer language. But then there's the ones and zeros level at the bottom where if you gave it to a computer, uh, that, that printout to a human, which is literally just a bunch of like little switches and an electrical board, no human can read that. And then there's the middle layer which connects the two. And so there isn't a good answer to can com humans read computer code. They can read aspects of it. They can't read other aspects of it. So are you saying that when you copyright, you copyright the top layer but not the bottom layer? Well, that sounds weird because they're all the same thing, just implemented. So that's another major issue, is copyright was written at a time in which the idea that you could have something which was both read and not re readable and not readable by humans didn't exist. We don't have something that applies nicely to software. It just doesn't exist. Um, another issue is when we were thinking about um, another thing that makes software very different from other types of intellectual property is if I write a novel, now imagine that I have my novel. No one is going to come along and try to take my novel word for word and insert it directly into their own novel. Like that just wouldn't make sense. Like imagine somebody who came along and like they wrote a beautiful story and then somebody was like, I'm going to write another story. And in this world, one of the characters is going to tell a story, and the story that they tell is just a copy word for word of somebody else's story. Like, this is very clear. No one would do that. However, there's somewhere where this does happen. What's the type of intellectual property in which you take something someone else has written, and you just insert it into your own for the purpose of making things simpler? Software um, development. <laughs> Yeah, so if you do this in an actual written work, like a novel or a song, it's plagiarism. But in software development, if you take, like, 
seven lines of code that do something very quickly and efficiently and insert it into your own code, there's a sense in which if you're applying copyright law, you've literally just plagiarized. But in other sense, like, well, but wouldn't that be like necessary for your computer to run? Like you yeah, would need that code. Right? Exactly. It's the sort of thing like why would you reinvent a particular line of code over and over and over again when like literally somebody's already done it, just put it in there. And yet the the idea is if you're using copyright law, there's a question of like, is this really fair use? It seems like this person is now literally going to be making money off of something you did, but also the thing you did is kind of obvious and simple and something that every computer program runs on. So there's this big issue of like, you can't take part of a novel and insert it in another novel, but you can take some code and insert it into another set of code and it'll run well. Yeah, so in terms of all that uh, we, have, we have just discussed, the combination would be the final product that is the case. Yeah, and here's the, the idea would be like, okay, the final product, that's what you can get your copyright on. But the worry becomes like, Where's the line between one final product being the same as another final product? Because what is constantly happening with software? Yeah, patches, upgrades, new versions. Like there's a reason why every time you open Change a program, blocks. it comes up with this. Oh yeah. Like you aren't running Microsoft Word, you're running Microsoft version 1.2.11.76 point four point two and anytime it's constantly getting updated so if you say that the final product is what you're going to use then the line between one final product and another final product is not always clear and it's just getting like intuitively we want to say like well you can't just take someone else's product and change it slightly and then call it your own but at the same time the line between a new version of something which you've stolen and a new product all your own is not clear cut and it gets less and less clear cut when you realize that the lines of code themselves can appear in different sorts of programs. Um, here's another issue. Uh, back to the version 2.76.4. When I sell you a physical copy of the book, and I give it to you, there's no way I have any control over that physical book anymore. It's in your hands, and if I want to change what's in there, like if J.K. Rowling realizes she miswrote a certain sentence, and she wants to change it, she would have to like knock on your door and ask, hey, can I change this line? What's the difference with software or any sort of digital version of a book? Say that again? You just update it? Yeah, update it, because when you sell something, the publisher of software still has some control over it in a way that isn't the case with physical copies of books. So why are they able to update the program? Well, because in some sense, they still own the program, even though you own the program as well. So every time a pro, like just let's use video games. If, a ga if you buy a game, uh, you spend your $50 on it, what's probably going to happen, the company is going to patch it. And if the company decides they fundamentally want to change the game, they can. If J.K. Rowling can't come along and just decide, you know what, I made a mistake, Harry Potter was the bad guy all along. It's not like you're going to suddenly one day open your book and suddenly Harry Potter's killing everyone. Like That's impossible because they, she physically can't touch the, what's written in your book. But with a piece of software or a video game, as an example, if they decide to change all of the characters and like get rid of half of them, change the gameplay completely, change what type of game it is, they can do that because of the nature of patching. And there's nothing you as the consumer can do about it. Game, like When you buy a game, you don't buy it in its completed final state because the company can keep changing it, which is just another fundamental difference. Is so fair, fair use is different because of the way of like, oh, what happens if you're quoting code? If you're quoting code, you're just using code. That's like, this is getting blurry. And also, first sale doesn't really work when things are constantly getting patched. So like when you buy Microsoft Word, you, you have it, but also what you have today might not be what you have tomorrow, and there's nothing stopping the company from changing what you've purchased. I think also another issue, but it's not like necessarily a specific issue, but I feel like it just raised like the ethical issues because like because you you can't like 
because it's not physical, it's not necessarily degradable, like, you know, so you don't have to worry about trying to preserve it so, so, like, like, religiously, like, you know, because, like, if, some, if you knew you had, like, something that was a physical property and it would be gone, you would have to, your people would go to the furthest extent to, like, make sure that nothing happened to it, but now, because you know something like that wouldn't happen, like, you would, it's like, the laws are going to change automatically. Yeah, so that's another major difference, it's just that, like, the ways in which we interact with our copies of things is really different, and the degree of protection we keep over them. Like we is should, totally we should value it more, but and like the integrity of it, but because like that we know we could just get it. Yeah, and this is another thing of just like part of the reason why people are so much more willing to give away like illegal copies of things is because it's so damn easy, and there's this sense in which like if it's this easy, how wrong can it be? Or, if it's this easy to get another one, like, why do I even have to be that careful about it? And so this is fundamentally a difference, and there's less of a sense, because you have less time to think about, in what I, is what I'm doing wrong? Like, think about what it would have taken, even like 50 years ago, to make a copy of Harry Potter based on the physical book. What would you have to do? To figure out what J.K. Rowling was about to write for Harry Potter, where she wrote it. Yeah, so basically you need to get a copy of the book, and then you literally need to get a typewriter out and copy it step by step. And during the 27 hours you were doing this, you'd be able to think, is this really right? Mm. But you know what takes a lot less time, and therefore you're not going to bother asking yourself, is this right? Control C, Control B. Like, that is too short of an amount of time to have any sort of moral qualms. Like you want, if it's that easy, no one's taking the time to ask themselves, is this right? And that's one of the major differences. Um, and then another final thing along this is just that, um, yeah, so another thing is when you buy something, there's a sense of, in which like the ownership over it is different than before. Because if I buy software, it's both my software and your software, because you're the company who produced it, which also means that if I buy, as we said, if I buy a physical copy of Harry Potter, I'm allowed to do whatever the hell I want. Burn it, throw it, flush it down the toilet. If I buy an ebook, what am I allowed to do? I'm allowed to read it. What else am I allowed to do with it? Like open it on a delete program. Yeah, delete about the only things I'm allowed to do are read it and delete it. I'm not allowed to give it to somebody else. That's actually against terms of service. And because in some sense it's still owned by Kindle or uh, Nook or iBooks or whatever the hell they're called, first sale is not really complete because because it's a digital copy, you aren't allowed to do anything you want with it. If I buy an operating system, if I buy a car and I want to just take a hammer and start smashing the inside of my car, I'm dumb, but I'm allowed to do it. <laughs> if I want to take it apart and see how all the parts fit, I'm allowed to do it. With software though, because the ownership is still partially with the designer, I'm not allowed to go into that operating system and do whatever I want with it. Like, there's a reason why with a cell phone, um, like, jailbroken cell phones are, like, a commodity and also illegal because you have, there are rules that govern how well, um, like, what you're allowed to do with a piece of software. So that's another major difference. So does everyone understand how this, this is what the fundamental issue with copyright and computer technology is, is our copyright laws were designed to govern a time when most trade was carried out on boats and horses, and any sort of property had to be physically printed and exchanged and copied by hand or by like mechanical machines. Now we have types of intellectual property which never existed, governed by laws which were designed for something very different, and we have provisions to help us with those things that did not take into account the fact that in 200, 300 years we'd have computer technology. So we just have laws that are just fundamentally not designed to deal with what, we're, what we actually have. And this also carries over to patents. So we said that patents are applied to things like inventions and processes. And there are three things that you have to have for patents. One, it has to be useful. You can't patent um, non-obvious, I, I have no idea if I spelled that right and I don't care, uh, and the last one is 
novel or new. So not everything is allowed to be patented. So what is an example of something which you might try to get patented, and then they're going to tell you, you can't get a patent on that, that's useless? A coffee mug. Yeah, a coffee mug. You can't get a patent. Well, actually, a coffee mug, I think, might not be uh, patented because that was not, ob or that's obvious. Like, everyone knows what a mug is. You can't get a, a coffee mug patented unless it's new and think another process you can't get patented walking if you go to the patent office and say i'm trying to get walking patented they're going to tell you we all know how to walk get out of here what about ones that are not useful so we can think of some wonderful inventions that nobody would ever be able to get a patent on because they're utterly useless so what are some examples what about the harness specially designed for high-speed unicorn riding. Ooh. Why couldn't you get that one patented? It's specially designed to fit the harness right over the horn and give you total control over your unicorn. Really? Yeah, there's no such thing as a unicorn. Exactly. It's useless because unicorns aren't real. Or the dragon riding saddle. Again, useless. Or, you know, the thing which allows you to count blades of grass in a space of, you pull, hold it down and it helps you count the graph in a 10 by 10 inch square. Useless. Nobody cares about these things. And also, novel. So, why am I not allowed to get, uh, I don't know, I can't get this marker. I decide to, this is called a quartet marker. I decide to make a company called Schwartet Markers and um, make it exactly like this one and then try to get a patent. It's not new. Yeah, it's not new. Another one, um, I'm not allowed to invent the process which makes beautiful blue water bottles because somebody's already done it. So that's the idea. You can't come up with things that people have already come up with. So anytime, like you, if, and this is why you think about things where people are now rich off of them, and you're like, God damn it, why didn't I think of that first? Like those little scooters with three wheels, like the ones that the kids are always riding around and like running you almost over with. Um, those scooters, do people know what I'm talking about? They got the two front wheels and like one back wheel. That thing is so obviously like, you know, first off, the original like two wheeled scooter with the little like roller skating wheels. I looked at that and I was like, why didn't I invent that? And then somebody came along and went, let's do that one, only make it harder for the kids to fall off. And now they're loaded. And I'm like, why couldn't I have thought of that one? or anything like this, where you're just like, why didn't I think of that first? Well, the reason why it matters that you didn't think of it first is you can't now make money off it because somebody's already done it. Um, so, this is what you need for patents. It needs to be useful, not obvious, and novel. So, what are the issues with this sort of thing and computer programs? Because remember we said that a computer software program is in some sense something that a human being can read, but on the other hand, the like low down level, the machine language, it seems like that's actually just a description of a process. And so there's an argument to be made that a computer program is something which should be able to be patented. Well, I mean, I don't know about any other like objections to patents, but I just think it is the my biggest objection is that it, the more you invent things, the less there's going to be. Of creativity for patents. Yeah, so that is one issue with patents is there is this worry of like as technology gets more and more and more complicated, are we going to keep being able to come up with new things and get paid for them? But thus far, we haven't quite reached the limits of human imagination. Uh, but I think that is a worry of like as things get more and more complicated, are people still going to be inventing them? Um, we haven't quite reached that point yet, though. But here's another issue. Uh, Non-obvious, which I now realize I think I definitely misspelled. Yeah, there's the U. Uh, Non-obvious. I try to get, here's something which you could try to get uh, patented. The process of adding one to a number. So I'm going to try, anytime you want to try to add one to another number, I want to have the patent to it. Why should or shouldn't this be allowed by patent law? So if you want to do any sort of thing, in which you add one, so I would then get money for it because you're using my process. What's the issue with this? Why isn't this applied to patents? Yeah, so what, it's toxic. 
First off, it's also obvious. Everyone knows how to add one. And so the reason that this sort of thing isn't allowed to be patented is because the, uh, one thing that's been decided is if a human brain can process this, this uh, production process or this sort of uh, operation, then you can't get a patent for it. So there have been various times where people have thought up things and been like, I want a patent for it. And the patent office has said, you cannot do that. That is just a mental process. A human being could carry that out in their head. Therefore, it's not something that isn't obvious, because a human could think that up. So does everyone understand here what I'm saying? Like, you can't get adding one process uh, patented. You can't get, uh, in an actual case, somebody tried to get the process of changing any number in base 10 to base 2 patented. So anytime you had a number that was written in like typical Arabic numerals, it would then put it into binary. What's the issue with this? The reasoning for saying they couldn't do this was, that's obvious. You can t any human brain can turn 10 into 2. But what's the another, and this goes back to the topic, what, what would the issue have been if this person had gotten this patent? What operates on the principle of turning 10 into 2? What are computer code written in? Like the down on the machine level? Zeros yeah. and ones. What's that called? Binary. Binary code. If this person had gotten a patent, they would own every single computer process ever written. And the argument for not being able to do this was, well, anybody could think that up. It can be run in a human mind. But this is kind of a slippery slope. Think about any type of computer code. In theory, any type of, any number of long computer codes is in theory runnable in a human mind. Because all it is is just an, like a recipe of instructions. And if you had a large enough memory, and you could keep things in your head well, you could run computer programs in your head. The issue is human brains aren't actually infinite, but there's this issue of is everything written down in computer code obvious in some sense, because it's all just descriptions of how to turn one idea into another idea and change some symbols around. So this is an issue which computer patents have run into, or uh, computer programs have run into, is there's been this major push not to make computer programs patentable because they are in some sense all obvious, which is itself kind of a weird thing. So does everyone understand what I'm saying here? I'm getting some blank stares, but basically the issue is computer programs are designed to do things, but they do things by moving symbols around. And the issue is that by, because they're just moving symbols around, basically all that computer programs are are just math. Like they're just very complicated mathematical formulations. And it, it would be weird to say like you could get a mathematical operation patented. Like that just seems very weird. Things we get patented are things like designing tires or uh, coming up with new missile systems and things like that. We don't get mathematical operations patented. And yet, if you say that, then no computer program can be patented, even ones which are used in mechanical processes, which leads to these very strange sorts of dilemmas. So that's a, what we see is when we're talking about computer software and copyright, it seems like computer software doesn't fit under copyright. So you might think, all right, then let's put it under patent. But software also doesn't seem to fit neatly under patent law. So we have this new technology which governs so much of our lives, and yet we don't actually have laws to govern who should have control over it. And that's what make the major issue is with copyright, and intellectual property law and software. We literally do not have the laws that neatly apply to the technologies that we have. Um, so does everyone understand just like what the issue is? We don't have laws for it. Shot. How should we approach to this problem then? So I think, well, it's the sort of thing in which the obvious answer to me is we need new laws. What kind of laws? Something, we need to come up with a new type of thing which falls somewhere between patent and copyright, it seems like, because it, we definitely want companies to be able to make money off of their software. Like if Microsoft couldn't make money off of coming up with new operating systems, they wouldn't bother. So they need to be rewarded in some sense, but we need to make sure that, because the current state of affairs is who has all of the power over determining what you can and cannot do with your operating system. 
Microsoft. It, and there's nothing to say, Microsoft, you cannot do that. And so there's this interesting state of affairs, which is when people go to court, like if somebody goes into their operating system and fiddles around and changes some of the code and Microsoft finds out about it, they will sue you. And when you go to court, what is usually the case is the, court, the judge will use the terms of service to decide whether or not what you did should or shouldn't be allowed. What's the problem with this? Who wrote the terms of service? Microsoft did. So you have this thing in which, because there's no law to fall back on, the judges go to a ter set of terms of service designed by the company who's benefiting from them to punish you for what you've done. And it seems like what needs to come along is something to allow some degree of first sale so that the company doesn't have complete control over this but also, in the same way, can get rewarded. Because we don't want it to be the case that Microsoft can't make any money off of it, or any company can't make any money off of their new software program. But it looks like we also need something that protects the consumer. Because right now, any company can do just about anything they want to you. Like if you...